Well, the, the clinical definition of paedophile uh, is someone who has a, a, um, a sexual interest in prepubescent children. So the term is often m much misused, really. It's used generally to describe people who have a sexual interest in children, but in actual fact, a paedophile is someone who has uh, sexual urges towards prepubescent children. Somebody who's interested in postpubescent children uh, would be an ahebophile. People don't tend always to specialise in, in um, e either being a paedophile or being a he an ahebophile. Uh, what we find is, is that uh, while some do, a significant number will cross over. Habits are quite hard for, for sex offenders because they, they try they try uh, not to present like sex offenders. Like it's 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 I suppose obvious that they uh, have a huge investment in hiding, um, and so therefore they will, in some cases, study the behaviours of sex offenders. We we see a, an addictive behaviour, much like you would an alcoholic or a drug addict. It's somebody who is either been a victim themselves and wants to explore other potential people and, and get a sense of normalcy because they sustained these same things as children. Uh, you see that pattern of behavior of uh, either not addressing the issue when, when they were younger or growing up with a curiosity or, or a mindset that it's a, a normal thing. The vast majority of people who are sexually abused as a child will not go on to become uh, a sex offender, but some of those who will, um, the ones who are more likely to do that, uh, are, one, are, are people who survive the abuse experience by normalising it, by telling themselves that was okay, uh, I liked that, or that's normal, that's something that happens to children. And so that belief system that is uh, emerging from that way of surviving the experience, um, we, we know that uh, that uh, is common among people who, who sexually offend, that they tend to have that type of characteristic or belief system. The vast majority of offenders, in my experience, will have to uh, uh, convince themselves that what they're doing is acceptable, and offenders will do that in a variety of different ways. Uh, some will go to some quite extreme uh, uh, mental gymnastics to try to persuade themselves that uh, children like sex, that uh, the child is uh, enjoying it as much as, uh, as they are, uh, that it won't harm the child, that the child is um, going to benefit in actual fact from, from uh, the sexual contact. Then there are other offenders who are, who are more callous and more um, uh, less concerned with, with the impact of their behaviour on the victim. Uh, and then there are others again who will uh, derive a, a, a pleasure and a delight from the distress that they cause to their victims. Their methodology is variable and their, the outcome that they're achieving is also variable. A lot of them will engage our undercover operatives for very fast sexual gratification. You do have um, typical types of behaviour in different abuse contexts. So for example if you, you take um, professionals who use their work as a cover for sexually exploiting children, uh, typically they will work very, very hard at being perceived as someone who uh, has the best of intentions um, in respect uh, of children. They tend to be the first person into work, the last person to leave work. They tend to be um, uh, exactly what an employer would want in actual fact, uh, the sort of perfect employee, um, always willing to put themselves forward for extra work or to spend more time with children. Um, so in that way they, they sort of hide in the open really. Um, uh, in, again in professional context we see um, other typical behaviour such as wanting to spend inordinate amounts of time with the children so that they don't actually have interests beyond the work environment. So they finish working with children and they go and volunteer to work with children and then they spend their summer holidays working with children. Now there are some uh, amazing people who do that and are not sexually interested in children but that is definitely a habit of, of, of people who, who sexually offend uh, in, in a work context. If we arrest somewhere between 140 and 170 child sex offenders every year through our operations, I can categorically state to you that there is no one size fits all. They are all walks of life. And we look at every member of the community, every occupation as being a potential threat to a child. The family home, uh, again, there are, there are some habits, again, not depending upon the, the nature of the offender that you're, you're dealing with, but 
uh, some of the more controlling uh, offenders will um, uh, will typically restrict the movements of uh, not just the children in the family but their spouses or partners as well so make it very difficult for them to uh, get out or spend time with other people. You know, many people believe that we've and I certainly grew up under this and, and perhaps you did as well as your parents said don't talk to strangers or, or you know you had the whole boogeyman scenario and we educated our children about the boogeyman. The problem is statistics will show you that most of the kids that have been sexually assaulted have been sexually assaulted by a family member or a parent uh, and so the whole protect your children you know the education I would give most people now is you need to n know your spouse and your uncle and your cousin whoever you're going to leave your children in care of don't worry about the boogeyman Worry about your immediate family and who has access to your children and, and why that person has access and do you trust them and who they are because reality is my experience and many of the people I arrested that were um, sexually abusing children, it was within the family. Part of the whole abuse uh, process is that uh, grooming to create an opportunity to be alone with a child and, and again f offenders will use a variety of different uh, behaviours for, for creating those sorts of opportunity and, and that's, um, if not a habit, is certainly a, an integral part of the abuse process. Another popular misconception that, that offenders will start downloading uh, indecent images of children and then progress on to contact sexual offending. Um, the, my clinical experience and some of the research evidence is now supporting the belief that people with a single conviction for possessing indecent images of children or child pornography as it's sometimes called um, uh, are probably already going to have committed a contact sexual offence against a child prior to their single conviction for possession of that material. So it's um, uh, it's not a good assumption uh, to make that, that offenders who are caught downloading uh, indecent images of children are on some sort of slippery slope heading towards a contact offence. It's more likely they already have committed a contact offence. The obvious um, downside of, of um, social media technology developments is it creates an environment where it's easier for them to connect and meet up with like-minded people. The internet itself has made this very much accessible by anyone from anywhere. While we in law enforcement try to go after things proactively, the companies themselves have their own responsibilities to try to look within themselves to identify these things and stop these things from occurring. The internet has presented us with an opportunity to change our focus to be very proactive uh, to stop sexual abuse at an increasingly young age. and. We're seeing in many of the investigations that we're doing now, particularly where we're intercepting images and videos that are produced by child sex offenders, that we're stopping sexual abuse uh, at under the age of three. And one would seriously hope that that stops a lifetime of suffering and abuse to that particular individual and they'll have a happy, normal life.